The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm Thomas Nagley. I'm here with Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius V. And he also serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And you? Just the same, Father. Good to see you there. You too. Thank you. Uh, Father, we have a lot of questions tonight, but any prayer requests you'd like to share? Oh, years? always. Uh, please keep praying for Ned. Ned Nelson is very sick. As they say, they've been trying for quite a while now to get his condition up to where they can do emergency surgery for him. But um, he got pneumonia while in the hospital and they've been trying to get that under control and evidently they have. Um, but Ned is still a very sick man and uh, his um, dear family's gathered around him there to support him that uh, he needs the grace of God to pull him through this. Okay, so. Please pray for him and his loved ones. Please uh, pray for Paul Riley, of course. As always, Paul uh, suffered a catastrophic accident uh, oh, months and months ago. And uh, he's come a long way, but he still has quite a way to go. So <clears throat> that we, we actually have that confidence that he can, he still has a long way uh, to go to improve. And he can, and he will. So we're praying for that. Um, and uh, there are so many others. Uh, whose names I've mentioned recently, uh, Dr. David Hofrichter, and um, I mentioned uh, Cheryl Johnson, I mentioned Cliff Hogan, right? And um, there are many, many others I could and probably should name too. But uh, Our Lady knows who they are. She's got them uh, in her immaculate heart. And I ask you to please uh, commend to, um, to our Blessed Mother and ask her to commend to her son, all of those intentions directed to her immaculate heart. That's what I do. I, I send them immediately there to her. Um, in a sense, putting them in her arms where, let's face it, that's where our Lord was when he came into the world, right? In her womb and in, under her heart and in her arms. So <clears throat> that's a good place for all of the, the intentions of our loved ones. Um, please do continue praying for our country. Our country is in very serious, serious danger right now. Perhaps more so than ever in her history, you know? and uh, that our country is threatened. And um, also, uh, of course, pray for the, the January 6th political prisoners being held in, in federal prison right now. Pray for every one of them, they need that help. Pray for our, the church, the church militant here on earth, pray. I know uh, we asked the church militant to pray for the church suffering in purgatory. Well, I ask for that too. Um, but the church militant right now is facing a very, very uh, serious challenges as well. And um, we know that you know, ultimately the church triumphs because Christ triumphs. And um, the question is the souls, the souls involved. We need to pray uh, for the souls here on earth that they, uh, <clears throat> that through all of this, all of this catastrophic immorality <clears throat> and defiance of God that there are souls who cooperate with the grace of God and find their way through to the throne of mercy. They find their way to God. They find their way to the foot of the cross, put their arms around the cross and hang on for dear life. That's what they need to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Father. We have um, some, uh, I'd like to start the program with some, some spiritual questions tonight, mm -hmm. Father. We, uh, one uh, in particular, you know, we, we began each program with the prayer uh, to the Holy Ghost, come Holy Ghost, 
And uh, there's a, a line in there, Father, where we pray to the Holy Ghost, send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. Um, and they shall, thou shalt renew the face of the earth. What, does, what exactly does that mean, Father, when you say that uh, they shall be created? What, what is that referring to? Well, that's a good question, Tom. I've had some pretty uh, intelligent people ask that question in the course of time um, because they find it to be kind of anomalous. Uh, you know, the prayer that we pray at the beginning of the show, right? Uh, asking the, the Holy Ghost, come, come Holy Ghost, <clears throat> fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love, and then send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Now, when our Lord ascended into heaven, <clears throat> Well, uh, when our Lord rose from the dead, he actually stayed 40 days on earth to instruct the apostles on what they were to do. <clears throat> he was preparing them for that great moment just before his ascension into heaven, when he would send them out and order them, going therefore, preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, instructing them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And then our Lord said that their salvation or damnation depended upon whether they accepted the, the teaching and the, the sanctification that came through the apostles from our Lord through them, or whether they, re if they rejected that justification and sanctification through our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything depended on that. That's how important it was. So the 40 days before that, our Lord was teaching them what they had to do. And so when you read the Acts of the Apostles, you read the, the fruit of that teaching, what, the, what our Lord had taught them during those 40 days, they were applying then during the, the period we read about in the Acts of the Apostles. And we can see what they did. And we know <clears throat> that they received that instruction from our Lord. And then our Lord ascended into heaven. But during that time, our Lord said to the apostles that, well, and, and actually even at the Last Supper, our Lord said, I'm leaving you. It is expedient for you that I go. And our Lord said, it's expedient for you that I leave you. Because if I do not go, the Holy Ghost will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I will send him to you. And that's what it required. So when we read about send forth thy spirit, we realize that the Holy Ghost, as St. Augustine expressed it beautifully, is the actual, I mean, existing love between the Father and the Son from all eternity. And that active love of the divine will of the Father and the divine will of the Son, which they share, that love between them breathes forth the Holy Ghost as the third divine person. And we know that the Father and the Son together right, are the principle of the, this spiration, as they call it, of the Holy Ghost from all eternity, because their love is there from all eternity. And so uh, the Father and the Son together actually breathe forth the Holy Ghost as an act of that divine love. And they also have the power to send the Holy Ghost. Uh, in one place, our Lord says, I will send him from the Father. And uh, in another place, whom the Father will send in my name. So uh, this makes it very clear that the Holy Ghost actually proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so our Lord tells the apostles, when he's facing them with the prospect of his leaving, his ascension into heaven, that it would make them very sad, but it's for their good, that he goes to send the Holy Ghost to them. So we have to have that kind of background to understand, send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. Now, if you open the book of the Bible to the book of Genesis, and you read the very first words, you're reading about <clears throat> the creation in the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth, right? And we read about the Spirit of God moving over the chaos of the waters and bringing forth the dry land. And the dry land signified order. The waters signified kind of chaos. The land signified order, some stability. And the, it was the Spirit of, the, of God who moved over that and brought order out of this 
this disorder, this chaos. And all of the order that was brought was, again, through the Spirit of God working in the world. Um, we have that spoken to us when we talk about the book, of, when we read the books of wisdom in the Bible, about the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God working through this divine Spirit, whom we know as the Holy Ghost, the Paraclete. Our Lord spoke to us as the Advocate. So, the prayer that we say there, it has to be related to both of these things. The movement of the Spirit of God over the chaos and bringing order out of the chaos at the creation. And our Lord's promise, I will send him to you. And what his mission is in the world to confirm in their faith those who believe and then also to engender in them the virtue of hope and the virtue of, of charity as well as faith. So this is how the Holy Ghost actually creates and recreates us. We come into the world as sinners and by the power of the Holy Ghost we are in a sense recreated now and restored not only to justification but sanctification by the power of the Holy Ghost through the waters of baptism, as the Holy Ghost moves over those waters, and through those waters brings life again into the world, this time not just condemned human life, but now life that has justification in the eyes of God, and that has the very life of God within it, sanctifying grace, that makes us children of God. So we talk about baptism as being a sacrament of the dead because it raises the dead to life. It brings what is dead in us to life. So when we talk about in the sacrament uh, or in that prayer, send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. It's related to all of that. And the Holy Ghost comes into the world to raise from disorder to order, from death to life, through, the, through baptism and the sacraments. And this is what we're praying for. We're praying for the justification and sanctification of human souls. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created. We're talking about God's saints here. We're talking about God's saints in a, the new creation. God. You, you understand? Yes, the significance of it. Yeah, that's very good. So when we pray that, we really should have that in mind. In the power, the working of the Holy Ghost, and what our Lord has sent him to do here. And it's sent to, in a sense, to recreate. Um... In a, in a second, second great movement of creation when the Spirit of God moves over the waters, in this case of baptism, yeah. and brings life. All right. Wow. Thank you. It's very good. Um, okay. Father, we had a couple of questions about um, the love of God. And uh, I guess the first one here, Father, what are some of the primary proofs of God's love for mankind? Well, that he puts up with us, that he endures us, right? Um, I mean, let's face it, if anyone can try God's patience, we're it, right? We see in the life of our Lord in the Gospel, when it talks about our Lord rebuking it and his apostles for their lack of faith. And, um, and our Lord then also looking at the, the total lack of compassion of the, of the Pharisees, it even tells us in the gospel, our Lord was angry. He was moved to anger by this. And yet, in spite of all of this, God actually puts up with us. He put up with us when we, when we fell at the beginning of creation, with the fall of Adam and Eve, and immediately prophesied the plan for our redemption. And the plan for our redemption, God knew, we did not know called for a virgin mother to bring forth a child, a virgin mother who would be, never be the enemy of Satan, but would be his enemy, bringing forth a child who would be the enemy of all the works of, child, of Satan, and that would be her son, who is the son of God. All of that was right there, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God proposed all of that for the future. No sooner had we fallen and offended God and defied him. <coughs> and all because of the temptation 
to become our own gods, right? To be our own gods. Kind of push them aside, say. Just like Satan, just like Lucifer himself, basically. It was the same idea. <clears throat> but God knew, because of our imbecility, that we could <clears throat> repent. Lucifer could not. <clears throat> but Adam and Eve and their children, you and I, could repent. And for the sake of that, God was going to do everything, everything, you might say everything he could, in a sense, to move us to repentance so that we would return to him. Now, not only created, but redeemed. And so what could be a greater testimony of God's love and a greater profession of his love than this. There's a little poem that is very touching, I think. And it's a cry to our Lord. Do you love me, Lord? I cried. This much, he said, and opened wide his arms upon the cross and died. And a very brief poem, but a very lovely poem that I think, you know, our children could easily memorize. And I think it answers that question. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, God gives us testimonies of his love, especially when we see him holding his heart out before St. Margaret Mary in her apparitions of the 1680s <clears throat> in Paris, in France. And he's, he's holding his hand heart out to her and saying, to her, behold the heart which is so loved. Mankind is, and is rewarded with so much forgetfulness, negligence, and contempt. And this is what he receives in response. <clears throat> but he doesn't indicate that his love is a thing of the past. Every indication he gives that his love is something that continues in spite of the forgetfulness, negligence, and contempt. For the sake of, as I talked about last program, for those perhaps relatively few people, but for those who would love him with a great love. And heaven knows there are those. There are those who have chosen to love him with a great love. Now, since then, somebody's contacted me and said, gee, I kind of found that very discouraging. If, <clears throat> if God would allow the rest of us to be lost <clears throat> for the sake of the relative few who would love him greatly, then what, what chance do the rest of us have? So I, I said to her, well, it's not a matter of chance, really, is it? It's a matter of choice. So just choose to love him with a great love. And there you are, right? You make that choice to, to love him with a great love. And that answers the question right there. You, know? you make that choice and hold to it, and he will provide the graces you need to accomplish that. And yes, you'll be among the saved. <clears throat> it's a choice we have to make. So um, I think it's, it's very clear that God does love us and continues to love us. Um, you know, everywhere you look in sacred scripture, everywhere you look in divine revelation, you find this. <clears throat> uh, the history of the saints who come to serve God so mightily and, and wholeheartedly in the life of the church, her tradition, um, the account of the Old Testament of God's persevering love with the betrayal of the chosen people, <laughs> um, constantly betraying him. Uh, our Lord and God even calling it adultery when they do. Again, kind of tying it in with, with what should be a bond of love <clears throat> and their betrayal of that love. Um, you have Lot in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah and kind of negotiating with God, well, if we can find just 10 just men, would you spare everyone for that? And God's saying, yes, if I can find 10 just men, I will spare Sodom and Gomorrah in spite of all of their evils. And again, I mean, it shows how valuable to God is the love of 10 just men who love him enough to be faithful to him and how God would spare all the rest because of that, you know? I think it, it's a very powerful testimony to, uh, to God's love even now, because it's clear that 
Well, maybe we're back in that situation right now. That Maybe it's down to the, if the God can find just ten just souls on earth who love him with a great love. <clears throat> Perhaps that is what holds back, with our Blessed Mother, holds back the avenging hand of our Lord, you know. Okay. So, yeah, the love of God on our part <clears throat> doesn't seem like much <clears throat> worthy of much consideration because we're creatures and we don't have powerful wills to love. We can't love as the angels love. And so as human beings, we have our human wills, which are rather frail. <coughs> we might say not capable of a great deal of love. And yet it's amazing how God treasures that love that we somehow eke out for him. <clears throat> God talks about finding the pearl of great price. And we interpret that to mean, well, when we find the faith <clears throat> and hope and charity, <clears throat> that's the pearl of great price that we find. If we find it in the field, <clears throat> there are those who will give everything else for the sake of having faith and hope and charity that ties them to God. That's the pearl of great price for us, right? That's the treasure buried in the field for us. <clears throat> but maybe there's another way to look at that. Maybe our Lord is also telling us that when he finds a soul in this world that loves him, that in his eyes, that is the pearl of great price for which he's willing to pay whatever price for the sake of that pearl or to find for that treasure that is buried in the field. Perhaps that's how God sees the souls of those who love him here. And he's willing to pay whatever price is necessary for them. Father, I think a, uh, a follow-up question would be why, why does God love mankind so much? What does he see in us that is so lovable? Now that is a mystery, right? Oh. That is a great mystery. But when God created us, he created us in his own image by nature. And all that means is that by nature, we are given by God, human, immortal souls, that somehow resemble him. And we know, and again, St. Augustine brought, expressed this very beautifully in writing about the Blessed Trinity, that in God we have not only the image of God as one God, one divine being, but the image of God as three divine persons also is in us. And St. Augustine explained, by the faculties of our soul, of intellect and will and memory, memory, intellect and will. And he relates that to uh, the blessed trinity in God himself, the one divine being we know as the supreme being who made all things. And um, so God loves that, that they might say that stamp is on us there. Right? Remember when our Lord uh, was asked by the Jews, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? And our Lord said, well, give me, give me the coin of, of the tribute. And our Lord held it up and said, well, whose image is that on the coin? They said, well, it's Caesar. Caesar's image on the coin. And that's when God said, that's when our Lord said, well, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He stamped his image on this, render that to him. But give to God the things that are God's. And he was talking about their own souls. Give that to God, because that image is stamped on your soul. You know? That's in his image. You are created. You know? So um, there's reason enough to see that God has a love for that. The, the nature, the human nature that he created and is in us. And even though it's marred by sin, we do not have the power to destroy our nature. That's where Luther went wrong. Luther thought we'd basically corrupted our very nature by sin. That's impossible. We don't have the power to do that. God himself minted our nature. We don't have the power to destroy the nature that God created. Uh, <clears throat> we can certainly disfigure it by sin. And, um, <clears throat> but, you know, then you move beyond that to a soul that is in the state of grace. That uh, is justified from sin by the power of Christ's cross. <clears throat> and now sanctified by, by the grace of... Uh, what we call sanctifying grace that makes the soul holy and pleasing to God. And uh, there you have what goes beyond the image of God in man. You, there you have the likeness of God in man. And again, I mean, we've talked about this before, Tom. I mean, <clears throat> when we talk about a child 
being the image of his father or the image of her mother. We say she looks a lot like her mom. She looks a lot, he looks a lot like her, his dad. Okay, but when we say he's in the very he's he's really a lot like his dad, that extends to a lot more than the way he looks. That extends to the way he acts, the way he thinks. <laughs> you know, he's 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 really like his dad. He's so much like his dad. It goes a lot deeper than merely the the outward image and the appearance, it goes into the very, let's say, character of the individual. And that's what grace does for us. It enables us not only to think in terms of truth and to love in terms of goodness, but enables us by grace to think like God, to think like God thinks, to love what God loves and to value what God does in us and to... Uh, uh, make the decisions that God wants us to make in imitation of our Lord. So we can imitate God now. You know? So th th there you have the image of God by nature and the likeness of God by grace in us. And yes, you can see why God actually sees the soul in sanctifying grace as his own child, um, adopted through the blood of Christ on the cross. So we really do become his adopted children through the baptismal font, where we receive a second birth. And it's like the adoption that God grants us. <clears throat> so much so that, when, as St. Paul says, when we're adopted by God as his child through baptism, through grace, we have an inheritance. We are entitled, as it were, <clears throat> we have a claim on an inheritance. What is that inheritance? Heaven, everlasting life. Yeah, everlasting life, right? That's what St. Paul says, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, that's the only answer that I know. <laughs> it serves as an answer, a real answer. Yeah. Father, are, are angels uh, created at all? And any, do they have any likeness to God? And, and um, could you say that God loves man more than he loves angels? Well, uh, God does love the angels, and God did create them also to know and to love and to enjoy what is beautiful. I mean, these are the three things that the human soul can do. <clears throat> and even an atheist <clears throat> who proclaims himself an adamant atheist <clears throat> is proving the existence of God because he couldn't even think in terms of being a theist or an atheist if he didn't have a soul. I mean, the very concept is there. You know, you talk to the great apes, supposedly our closest relatives, you know, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the tree. Um, apes, apes never declare themselves atheists or theists. They have no ability to even think in those terms. It doesn't even occur to them. It's impossible that it occurs to them. Apes just don't have the means of formulating these thoughts. They don't have spiritual souls. <clears throat> and I, I, you know, often I, I was just talking to one of our uh, students earlier today. I said, look, you know, you're, <clears throat> you're sitting on a mountaintop looking at a beautiful sunset and you are, it's just breathtaking to you. Well, <clears throat> according to the evolutionists, your closest cousin on the evolutionary tree, a great ape is sitting next to you and the great, great ape is totally unimpressed. It means nothing to him. I don't care how beautiful a sunset is to you. It means nothing to him. You want to go and get your friends and relatives to see this because it's so beautiful. You want to share it with them. The ape isn't running off to get the rest of the tribe or whatever. You can get them up there and say, hey, look, i got to show you something. This is fantastic. It doesn't even occur to them. Nothing. What's the ape thinking of? Bananas. But even there, I mean, you know, babies have had bananas for a long time. But no ape has ever come up with a recipe for banana cream pie or coconut cream pie or anything of the kind. It just it doesn't register, you know. They might accidentally stumble across some means of opening a coconut that works and using tools that, like a rock to do it. But a three- or four-year-old child can do that. Before the child uses the age of reason, yes. And so you'd say, okay, well, an ape should be able to do as much as a, as a human child does before it reaches the age of reason and is able to start actually reasoning things out. Because it's the soul that enables the child 
to reason and to understand things in their causes. But the ape is not going to understand things in their causes. The ape can just, by trial and error, discover, hey, this works. I can get my food this way. But that doesn't mean the ape is understanding. So, no, there, there, is, there is a soul. And uh, God loves that. He created that for his love. He created a being that is capable of knowing him and loving him, serving him, and rejoicing in him as it rejoices in what is truly beautiful. The angels were created to do that too. And so, yes, the God did love the angels, but they had a choice to make. And there were those who chose themselves as autonomous beings. They had their existence. And rather than acknowledge the existence of God as being the only substantial, self-substantial uh, being, they chose to worship basically themselves and the perfections that they had as though they did not derive them from God, as though they were entitled to them. That sense of entitlement has been our downfall ever since. But, um, but even there, I mean, those, those fallen angels still still have the nature of angels. And to the extent that they have the nature of angels, then naturally, even in hell, they still, they still glorify God by that, the nature that God gave them in spite of themselves. They, in spite of themselves, they do that. It's one of their torments, you know. But they can't defeat that. They can't defeat the creative power of God in giving them that nature. And uh, <clears throat> even there, they're forced to acknowledge the truth. But that is not is not to their benefit, unfortunately. Uh, can can God love a human being more than He loves an angel? He can. The question really comes down to: Can God give to human being and the frail human will the power to love more than an angel naturally loves, or even supernaturally? Can God give? A, what is naturally a weaker will, ours, the power to love him more by grace than even the greatest of the angels? And the answer is God could do that. Of course, he could do that. He does that with our Blessed Mother. It's a mystery, but it's true. And again, this just manifests the divine power that he can do that. They can exalt by her humility and this is, again, not part of the question. Could God grant to a human creature the grace to have a greater humility than an angel? And the answer is, well, yes, he could, of course. And giving her, in this case, Our Lady, the grace to have a more profound humility before God, could God then also, through that, exalt her and give her the great grace to love him even more than the angel. And the answer is yes. Not only could he, he did. But again, I mean, we see this in divine revelation. In the great sacred scripture, a terrible sinner. A woman whom we read from the Father of the Church was St. Mary Magdalene. A woman out of whom our Lord had cast seven demons. Came into the home of a Pharisee where she was totally despised. And she was moved to come because she saw our Lord welcomed as a guest, but an unwelcome guest, right? They didn't even show our Lord that just basic civilities, just common decency. The, the guest who comes, you know, he, he, he got nothing to wash his feet from wash, walking there. Um, the oil that they would use to anoint their guests, the fragrant oils and so on. Um, our Lord didn't get any of that. They didn't give any. They didn't even offer it to him. And she was so moved that she went and she um, washed his feet with uh, his feet with her chairs and dried them with her hair. That's all she had, you know. Uh, and um, what did our Lord say to her uh, about her to Simon the Pharisee who was? criticizing him, our Lord, for letting this sinful woman touch him, you know. And our Lord actually asked Simon a simple question. 
Um, <clears throat> a man had two debtors, right? One owed him a great deal, and the other owed him much less. And he gave, forgave them both the debts. Who should love him more? And Simon, I mean, he's a Pharisee, but he still got the point. He said, well, the one who loved him more, what, what the one who was forgiven a greater debt has reason to be more grateful and to love him more. <clears throat> and our Lord used Mary Magdalene as the example, saying, you see this woman here, this is what happened. And in a sense, it was our Lord saying, look, Simon, you didn't do these things for me, but she is willing to do this, you know. So, <clears throat> you know, again, I mean, who loves more? Right? He didn't actually explicitly say, you know, this woman loves me more than you do. You wouldn't even do this for me. He didn't say that. But he did. And it was kind of a paradox, the way I put it. He said, you see, she loves much. Because she has loved much, she has been forgiven much. But why did Mary Magdalene love our Lord so much? Because she was forgiven so much. So you, so you get kind of, not, not a vicious circle, but like a circle of grace almost, like a whirlwind of grace here. She's been forgiven so much that our Lord has showed mercy on her. I mean, they say that she was the woman who they were dragging out to stone to death. When our Lord, they came to our Lord, and they didn't. <laughs> you know, they all walked away. <clears throat> and after they walked away, our Lord said to her, has no one condemned you, woman? This is one of those times that our Lord addressed someone as woman. And it wasn't a rebuke. It wasn't criticism. And, uh, and, the, and, and Mary Magdalene, it was Mary Magdalene, said, No one, Lord. And our Lord said, Well, neither than I, well, I will condemn you either. But go, sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. So she had received forgiveness for these terrible sins. She loved much. But then, as our Lord said, she's been forgiven much because she loved so much. And, you know, you say, well, how is this, like, which comes first? It's like a chicken and egg thing. But then you think, well, wait a minute, now this is God deciding this. So maybe God knows that here's a woman who is willing to receive the grace of loving much to be forgiven. And so it is his action that precipitates, that initiates this whole process of her sanctification <clears throat> by the fact that he loves her with such a great love. <clears throat> that, you know, he extends that first and she responds to it. And that, that response of love on her part is what <clears throat> actually completes the process of that absolution that he gives. It's a mystery, though. It's a mystery of grace. But God does love. And so I'm, but I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because <clears throat> our Lord is showing here that he can move a human heart, a human soul, to love him with a great love. And uh, to take her even out of the, 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 the depths of sin and this own little private hell she was living in, as it were, right? With this condemnation hanging over her head and, and raise her up to a great level so that who do you have standing under the cross, his own cross, representing all of mankind, the Blessed Mother, St. John the Apostle, and this woman who loved much, Mary Magdalene. So, a very chosen souls, right? <laughs> so yes, God can give a human will, weak as it is, by grace, the grace to love him even more than the angels. And this is what the angels see in heaven. And they're not jealous. They're in absolute admiration of the power of God. They glorify him for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, um, it's very beautiful thoughts, Father. One, maybe one final question on this, uh, on this topic. You kind of hinted on this earlier, but one of our, our viewers did want to know how uh, God can continue to love mankind so much when he's so, uh, so consistently mistreated by us. It's just that God loves so much. It's just that it's God. It's divine love. It's div His divine will. And he sees what we could be if we cooperated with his grace. And he's willing to give that grace. <clears throat> he's willing to give that grace, even extending that grace to those who will not cooperate with him. He's willing to die on the cross for those who will reject it and, and still go to hell and not love him. He's willing to die for them too. But that's the superabundance of God's love. That's divine love here. 
I, I liken it to a parent. I mean, you have a child. You have a child. A couple. If not, several. Yes. Uh, and uh, every one of these children you have, <clears throat> you love them with a great love. And uh, you love them with a love that, you know, you would give your life to save that child, to rescue that child. And that child cannot love you at all. That child doesn't even know you, has no recognition of you, has no concern for you, and uh, is certainly incapable of loving you. That child will not be capable of loving you for years. The child will have to, has to learn to love. And you get a three-year-old child saying, I love you, mommy. I love you, daddy. But <clears throat> they love as a three-year-old loves. And, you know, it's just a three-year-old child. But they were still willing to... <clears throat> throw tantrums and not eat their beans and peas and, you know, and, and put you through all this distress, even though they say they love you, but they cause you a lot of pain, suffering and, and heartache and anxiety, right? So again, their love is just very, very, uh, which I say, <clears throat> rudimentary love. But it's a step in the way of learning to love. And God's love for us is so great that he loves us when we don't, uh, even before we seem to be capable of loving him. <clears throat> um, he loves us because he sees, he wants to invest his love in us to see essentially what, what he can make of us, what we will allow him to make of us by our cooperation. And uh, it, again, it's, it's just the power of divine love. It should make us wonder and uh, be so grateful and so willing to, uh, you know, want to know what that love is and to respond to it, really. Now, Tom, I'm going to double cross you because every time you say last okay. question, <laughs> I, I pull the rug out from you because I know there are other questions on that page here. There I can are, see it from here. There are other questions. Uh, <laughs> want to be quickly go through them if we can. Okay. Here. All right. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, if people wrote in and they asked these things, yeah. I just yeah. feel kind of an obligation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep you. You probably have pressing obligations. No, that's okay, Father. <laughs> yeah. I think these are some great questions here. Uh, Father, could you say a few words about the responsibilities of godparents when they see their godchildren faltering in their practice of the faith? Well, they're godparents precisely because they have an obligation to respond to that. And they have an obligation to be praying for their godchildren um, all from the moment they, be, they become godparents, they have an obligation to pray for those in a special way and to uh, set a good example for them in a, in a special way, extraordinary way, and to watch over them and their growth in the faith. If they say that their grand godchildren are faltering in their faith, <clears throat> again, they, they need to be there. They need to be instant to be there. Just as if <clears throat> like a parent sees a child stumbling and is going to fall. A child rushes to catch that child. So a godparent should do that same thing. <clears throat> and that doesn't mean that the godchild, <clears throat> who might then be 10, 20, 30, 40 years old, it doesn't mean they're going to be, going to be amenable to being caught. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't absolve the godparent of the obligation to try to catch them and do what they can to stop them. Yeah. You know, how? Yeah. By prayer? By good example? Exhortation? Admonition. Look at the spiritual works of mercy. Godparents are meant to do them all. If you want to say, well, what's the program for a godparent? Read the spiritual works of mercy. And there you are. That's what the godparent is supposed to do for the godchild. Okay. All right. Uh, Father, what apologetic resources would you recommend to someone who is weak in their faith? Well, it depends on why they're weak in their faith. Are they having doubts and just kind of tepid because, like the apostles, they had a weak faith and it took little to shake them? I mean, one can be weak in his faith or challenged in his faith because of intellectual reasons, because, you know, he's allowed his mind to be exposed to doubts about the faith, you know? Um, I was sent to study in Innsbruck, Austria, under the Jesuits at the University of Innsbruck. And I knew that they would be modernists. But I thought, well, they were also speaking in German. So I'd have a little insulation there. I'm not gifted with languages. 
And yet, sitting there in that classroom day after day after day, yeah, I was understanding them all too well. And what they would do is they would pose doubts about matters of faith, pose doubts about them, and they never answered them. They wouldn't answer those doubts. And after a while, I, I think everybody in the classroom pretty much had the same reaction. Well, gee, they raise these questions and then leave them hanging and never give us answers. And maybe there are no answers. Maybe it's just these questions that have never been answered. <clears throat> and then you actually take the time to go look and you find these questions were answered 800 years ago by St. Thomas Aquinas. He posed these same questions. He answered these questions very powerfully. Don't they know that? If they don't, how ignorant can these teachers be? And they're supposed to be professors. And if they do know, how diabolical can they be in posing these questions and letting them hang there? Um, to, to, you know, raise doubts in people's minds about their faith. That's awful. Uh, so it became kind of a prod to me to begin to investigate um, the answers that the church has had for so many years, centuries and centuries. Uh, and it pretty much exposed the perfidy of the modernists. To me, you know. <clears throat> So the question is, I mean, are they intellectual doubts that are raised in people's minds and they can go and ask questions and get answers? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, people like that can do some reading. They could even go to the Summa if they have questions about the faith. And they could say, well, what does St. Thomas Aquinas have to say? <clears throat> you can go to the Summa Theologica online right now. And uh, at the New Advent website, <clears throat> have access to the Catechism of Council of Trent. See what the Catechism says on that subject, if you have an intellectual doubt or a question, um, go to St. Thomas Aquinas, they say. You know, read what it says there. Go to the councils of the church, writings of the fathers. We have all these resources to find the answers that we need if there are intellectual questions. All too often, though, it's not that. All too often, it's a matter of emotion and feeling. All too often, <clears throat> it's just that they, they kind of have lost the fervor because they've become rather lax. <clears throat> and so their enthusiasm for their faith is kind of fading away. <clears throat> and so it's more of a mood they're in or, or an emotional state they're in just to be kind of uh, lackadaisical, even almost resent practicing the faith because it requires sacrifice and they just don't want to do it. And so someone like that, it's sort of like leading the horse to water, but how do you make them drink? You know, you can provide an offer to find whatever answers they need and they may raise questions, but those aren't really the problem. You know, and, and, and you can tell that because you answer the questions and you know the answers are good answers. And they just change the subject, move on, and you know they're just avoiding that because it's not really the issue. It's that they just don't want it. It's too much trouble and they can't be bothered or it's somehow in the way in their life. They want things in life um, that, you know, the faith somehow um, doesn't let them have, you know, says, no, that's wrong. <clears throat> so in a case like that, it's a matter of willfulness and... Uh, in a case like that, you, you, you can only exhort them and ask them to do spiritual reading. I mean, the Summa Theologica, the, uh, or the Summa Theologiae, something, which I think is more accurate, really. And, and uh, the, the reading of the Fathers of the Church, their sermons, um, and uh, the Catechism Council of Trent, and so on. The, the decrees of the councils of the Church, those are intellectual. They answer the intellectual matters of faith. But as far as shoring up a weak soul because of a lack of fervor or love for God, they need spiritual reading. And for that, I mean, don't give them the summa. Give them the uh, imitation of Christ, right? Uh, give them, and if they're fighting a battle, give them uh, the spiritual combat. Uh, give them some, something like... Uh, you know, light and peace, um, books of spiritual comfort, consolation, and motivation. Mm -hmm. That's what they need then. <clears throat> but 
yeah, the, the, the answer is there. Church has it there. The divine revelation and divine sacred tradition have those answers if people will do that. Uh, for example, it was proposed to me one day that some young man, he was in his late 20s, late, late teens, I should say, <coughs> but he was more intellectual, and he was one of those who was kind of prone to analyze and overanalyze and think things through. And he was having issues and matters of faith. So when I heard, not from him, but his parents who were talking to him and hearing what he had to say, what his issues were, I said, well, this sounds like more like an order of a G.K. Chesterton issue. So I just said, why don't you <clears throat> give him, give him uh, some of Chesterton's writing, writings to, uh, to read, because it sounds like that's kind of the track he's on in his way of thinking, of working out these seeming paradoxes. <clears throat> and I found out years later that it actually pulled him back. Um, <clears throat> he just had to basically kind of join Jesterton in thinking these things through on his way to embracing the faith. You know? So, um, in recommending anything to somebody, you can pray, asking God to give you the light to see, okay, what should I recommend? Sort of like a doctor prescribing something to a patient mm -hmm. who needs help. You know? <clears throat> wow, that's good. Thanks, Bye. Um, just a couple quick questions about the old law. Uh, one of our viewers wanted to know, uh, was the old law entirely of divine origin, or did Moses author some of the laws with God's permission? The old law is of divine origin. Totally, completely? It's divine revelation. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. When he's talking about the, <clears throat> the old law, meaning the Ten Commandments and the, the laws concerning the, the Jewish prescription of the temple, mm -hmm. Uh, observance on, yeah, those are, those are God's revelation. Okay. Uh, then he <clears throat> asks a follow-up question. How can we say that the old law wasn't perfect if it was entirely made by God himself? Uh, so that's why the other question was getting right. It was, if the law was imperfect, how could it come from God? So did Moses make up some of this stuff? And that's where the imperfection was. And the answer is, no, the law was not imperfect <clears throat> because Moses, uh, shall we say, um, ghost wrote some of it for God, filling in certain gaps. It didn't work that way. God is the author of the old law. But the old law was not perfect because the old covenant itself was not perfect. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> because the people of the old law were not prepared for perfection yet. Um, as I mentioned, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord said, I've not come to destroy the law, meaning the old law, but I've come to perfect it, to complete it, to, to bring it to, to, to um, you know, perfection, to put it that way. Our Lord said that in the Sermon on the Mount, and which is where our Lord himself telling us that indeed the old law was not perfect, but I am now bringing it to perfection. I'm finishing it, as it were. I gave you part of God's law, or God gave you part of his law, <clears throat> but now I've come to give you the rest. And we see that in the eight Beatitudes, the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, and so on. You know, uh, That's what we see in the new law. Um, <clears throat> so our Lord didn't discard the old law entirely. Certainly not the Ten Commandments that are part of human nature, really. Uh, the old law, insofar as it was merely a symbol of the coming Savior, yes, that has given way to the reality, right? The Paschal Lamb, we don't sacrifice lambs by slitting their throats and bleeding them out and eating them sitting on the ground with our staffs in hand ready to leave Egypt. We don't do that anymore because we don't paint the blood of the Lamb on our homes anymore because the Lamb symbolized Christ and He is the Lamb of God. He is the fulfillment of those things. <clears throat> those things have to give way. If we did all of that, we'd be either putting on a play <clears throat> to say, oh, look, this is what they did in those days as part of the play, dramatizing it. Or if we did it as a religious observance, we would be effectively, at least implicitly, denying the reality of Christ, that we still have to sacrifice this lamb and paint his blood on our, on our lintels there. <clears throat> as though denying that Christ came and actually put his blood on the cross 
and redeemed us. We all we can do now is just keep sacrificing this these lambs over and over again, eating the lambs, and you know, hoping for the best that God sends a redeemer. Well, if if doing all of that, and it became very popular after Vatican II for Catholics to go through the Seder Passover celebration, it's an implicit denial that Christ really is the Savior, and that all of this has been fulfilled, and these shadows have passed, because now the Son has risen, literally, <laughs> the Son has risen. So. Um, no, we can't do that. Now, why would God give Moses an imperfect law? He gave them the law that they needed to prepare for the coming of the Savior, essentially. That the old law was given for the sake of preparing the way for the coming of the Savior. And even that was very hard for them to, to keep. Very hard for them to live up to. Even the old law, incomplete as it was, but when our Lord stood there facing the Pharisees as he was on his way to Jerusalem, and they confronted him. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Put away his wife and take another. And I said, no, it's adultery. They said, but Moses said we could. And Jesus said, well, Moses tolerated that, meaning in a sense God tolerated that because of the hardness of your hearts. God was willing to tolerate that. And we've already talked about God's toleration, haven't we? We've already talked about that, right? <laughs> as, an ex as a function of God's love, how much he tolerates. Witness the world today at this very moment, how much God is willing to tolerate. So that shouldn't surprise us that God tolerated that. But when God, but our Lord said to Moses, what our Lord said to the Pharisees, it was not that way in the beginning, though. And it will not be that way from now on. He was restoring the original plan of the father in marriage no more we're not going to tolerate that anymore no more divorce our lord was speaking with the authority of god saying <clears throat> you had kind of this grace period here to tolerate this <clears throat> but i've come now to perfect the law bring it to completion and that's it no more from now on this is the new way the new law <clears throat> so he really laid down the law the new law <clears throat> Um, so again, you know, if the old law was not complete, it's because God was willing to tolerate and put up with our failures and our weaknesses <clears throat> for the coming of the Christ to be the one to actually finally restore <clears throat> the law of God exactly as he wants us to live it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Father, there is a very, uh, popular, uh, kind of catchphrase that you hear a lot today where, uh, we say that uh, we are supposed to hate the sin and not the sinner. Mm -hmm. Some of our viewers wanted to know, is that actually a, a Catholic saying? Is that um, accurate to say that we should hate the sin and not the sinner? Yes, what? exactly. That's a very Catholic saying. Yeah. Because uh, the sin is evil because it is contrary to the love of God. We get, we're not allowed to hate the sinner because... Um, our Lord created a sinner, but he also died for that sinner, for the salvation of a sinner. And God wants not the death of the sinner. He wants that the sinner be converted and live, right? And so what God sees when he sees a sinner, he even sees, you might say, a potential saint. That if that person cooperated with grace, that he could actually become a saint. And let's face it, except for our blessed lady, every Every saint in heaven was conceived in, a more, in original sin, except Adam and Eve, too. I mean, we believe that they saved their souls, right? But they, cre they, they weren't conceived in original sin, but they committed it. So they had it, too. Uh, in fact, they're the ones who did it. We didn't commit it, but we got it, right? It's a sin of nature. We inherited it from them. <clears throat> Only our Blessed Mother, and by a very special privilege, unique to her, <clears throat> um, did not have original sin. The rest of us, yes, we're all sinners, and every saint in heaven <clears throat> had to overcome that sinfulness and the, the fomes peccati, the tendency to sinfulness that we have. Um, so God sees us in, in all of this. Even the, even the saints in heaven, God sees what sinners could become if they cooperate with his grace and how wonderful it is. And so it is that um, we are not permitted to hate the sinner. We must... Again, 
will with God and love with God. And love as God loves. And God wants not the death of a sinner. He wants him to be converted and live. And so that's our, that's our mission. We have to pray for their conversion and work for their conversion too. Okay. Well, Father, um, those were all the viewer questions we had for mm -hmm. tonight. We covered a lot of spiritual topics, so thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Very good. Any, um, you know, this does raise a question, though. Yeah. So I always try to tie it in with what's going on in the world today. Yeah, what's going on? Because people ask, wherever I go, people ask those questions. Yeah. They may not send them in to what Catholics believe. No. But people are asking these questions out there. <clears throat> They're asking questions about what's happening in our country. We just had the Republican National Convention. And we have the Republican Party platform. We have the Democratic National Convention. We have the Democrats Party platform. And people are kind of torn. What do we do? What do we do? This is like being caught between a rock and a hard place. Right? What is the right thing to do? People today are asking what is the right thing to do. Some are convinced they know. Others are not so sure. They're the more, let's say, humble souls. <clears throat> but in any case, <clears throat> uh, for those who are confused and uncertain, <clears throat> well, you know, it's a matter of <clears throat> voting according to what, uh, well, <laughs> talk about lesser, voting the lesser of two evils, but you're not voting for the evils. If there is, uh, you see, I always looked at that, voting for the lesser of two evils. It always bothered me even to use that expression. Because when you when you actually cast a ballot, <clears throat> you're saying, okay, <clears throat> yes, this party represents evils. Okay, let's just call them the Republican Le Republicans. They call them the Republicans in their new party platform. <clears throat> yeah, there there are things that are amiss there. Uh, the demagogues, <clears throat> which well we know who that stands for. The demagogues and their platform, we know what that stands for. Now, I'm not going to vote for the evil in the either platform. <clears throat> if there's any good, though, I'm going to vote for that. <clears throat> I'm going to vote for the good. And if they stand for anything good, that is according to the natural law of God, I will vote for that. So I'm not, in any case, going to vote for the evil. <clears throat> but if they stand for something good, and they promise something good, and standing up for something good, yeah, even though they're not perfect, even though there are a lot of problems with it. Again, God tolerated a lot from all of us <clears throat> that I have to vote for the good that is there. And that's how I have to look at it. What good would them, they do as opposed to what they would do? Maybe this group would do no good whatsoever. Maybe it's all bad. I can't vote for any good that they would possibly do. And maybe there's a choice where I say, okay, well, they've got three things right in this 20 program you know, 20 step program. <clears throat> and for the sake of those three things, I can vote for that. <clears throat> I will vote for those three th good things that they do. Um, one of the things, for example, that came up recently that, that created kind of a storm of controversy, <clears throat> oddly enough, even on the side of the leftists <clears throat> uh, or the liberals, I, you know, this whole idea of conservative liberal, I think it's a fake, yeah. I think it's a fake stage. Uh, setting there to confuse people. <clears throat> it's all relative. But uh, <clears throat> but even the, the liberals were up in arms. <clears throat> Some of them, when uh, um, Kamala Harris, by, her, 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 by the way, she's named after like a Hindu deity, uh, like a, what we as Christians would consider to be a, like a demon, so-called goddess. Uh, this is the name signifies something destructive. <clears throat> um, Anyway, regardless, um, that she is uh, thundering about price controls, that price controls are the answer. And uh, you know, anybody who has any, any basic knowledge of economics or history knows that price controls have been tried, and every time they've been tried, they've ended in total disaster and enormous suffering. Now, she probably doesn't know that, okay? Because she doesn't show a lot of, shall we say, um, wisdom or education or whatever, okay? Uh, whatever I would say. Um, I mean, some of these speakers are very clever. 
They're very clever, but they're not intelligent. Are they smart? Well, it depends on what you mean by smarts. But there's a big difference between cl being clever and being intelligent. And a, a, a demagogue is not intelligent, but he's very clever. And he can dupe a lot of people. And some of them who are much more intelligent than he is, but they're swept away by the, <clears throat> by the clever antics of the demagogue. And that's why I think we're dealing with demagogues here, because they're clever. Um, but, for example, price controls, we know, are totally contrary to human nature. So if you put them into effect, they're going to end in disaster. Every time they've been tried, they have. And people talk about the communists and the socialists, and I guess that's why I thought it's good to talk about that a little bit. Because the church, church's teaching formally condemns socialism. But Pius XI said it is impossible to be a true Catholic and a convinced socialist. It's impossible. You cannot mix the two things, okay? It's just like it's not impossible to be a Catholic and a modernist, a wholehearted modernist. They, they can't mix. Modernism is a synthesis of all her heresies. So if you're a full-blown modernist, how can you be a Catholic and have the Catholic faith? It's impossible. So in, in any case, when we look at what's happening in the world today, we're saying it does absolutely involve Catholic teaching, Catholic social teaching. And this is what is at stake here, really, ultimately. <clears throat> Price controls? Yeah, it sounds good. <clears throat> but because they sound good, it's almost like the rat poison that tastes good, but it will kill you. Um, one of the worst persecutors of the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church, in history, was a man named Diocletian. He was the man who was <clears throat> basically... <clears throat> the perpetrator of the 10th and most ferocious persecution of the church. He wanted to make every single vestige of Christianity disappear from the face of the earth. I mean, Voltaire himself couldn't do better than that. You know? So Diocletian, who reigned for quite some time, came after Valerian, another persecutor of the church, <clears throat> Um, and Diocletian came to the throne and he had Caesar's like assistant uh, emperors to you know govern certain parts of the empire and again some of them were really bad uh, one of them was uh, Constantine's own father in Britain Constantius Chlorus, Constantius Chlorus but he had Galerius in the east and so on and Galerius was a very bad guy and uh, whether it was his influence or not, but I don't know. <clears throat> but Galeria certainly encouraged the persecution of Christians. Diocletian didn't start that way, but he's, he came into the role of being the, the most fierce persecutor of Christianity. <clears throat> and um, he was the one of all people, this, this most hateful persecutor of Christians, Diocletian, who actually instituted the price controls that racked the empire and did so much damage. It was in the year 301. And in Latin, I mean, the, the title of the decree was the, the, the decree about controlling prices, right? According to controlling the prices of goods. Uh, why, why would they do this? Well, number one, because the, the emperors before him had totally debased the currency. I mean, the, the real value of the coinage, the silver value, they had been basically draining from the coins until the coins were actually worth only a fraction of what they were originally worth just even a few years before. And so the currency was totally debased. <coughs> Soldiers were getting paid, and the, the money was worth very little, right? And, and it was worth less and less and less as, as time went on. Uh, they were buying less and less food with the money that was paid them. Meanwhile, conversely, you would say, the, the, the merchants were charging more and more money for the food because the money was worth so much less and less and less that they were being paid for their goods. Now, government caused that problem. The government of Rome caused that problem, the inflation. <clears throat> and so who's going to solve the problem? The government, of course. They're going to solve the problem. And how are they going to solve the problem? By price controls. What does the government do? 
to tell the soldiers who are disgruntled because their pay is not su supporting themselves and their families. <clears throat> They're telling the soldiers, well, it's, it's because, you know, you're being charged so much. That's why your money is worth so much less. <clears throat> and, and people are complaining, you know, about the cost of turnips and the cost of whatever, you know. Uh, and they're being told, well, those merchants, they're, they're gouging. They're, it's a price gouging. They're, they're charging you so much more for the same food now. It's their fault. And it wasn't their fault. The government put them in the situation where the money was debased, worth less and less and less. <clears throat> and they had to charge more and people had to pay more. <clears throat> and it was, a, it, was, it was bad. So Diocletian comes forward with his grand plan. And it was a grand plan. I mean, there are remnants of stone tablets and, and so on in the East that show remnants of this decree that was set. <clears throat> and the prices for everything. Prices for everything were spelled out there as to how much merchants could, could uh, charge for a tomato, a potato. Well, I don't know if they had potatoes, whatever they had to sell, you know, leather goods, uh, <coughs> a sword, everything. They went down meticulously and said, this is the most you can charge for this, whatever it is. And, and it was punishable by death. If you paid more on the black market, you could be put to death for doing that. Even if it was because your family was starving and you couldn't get the, you couldn't get the food. If you paid more on the black market, if you charged more, you'd be put to death. It was a capital crime to deviate from those price controls. That's how desperate they were. And... Um, and Diocletian said, and you can't charge more if you, as a merchant, have to pay more to transport the goods to market. So if you have a load of whatever it is that you've got to get to market, and now, because of my price controls, you're paying more to have your food delivered to the forum or wherever, you can't charge any more for that, even though you're paying more for it. You have to take a loss. So the merchants are starving too. And they're the ones who have the food. And if they deviate from that to try to make an honest living, they'd be put, subject to being put to death for it. It was an awful, awful situation. The entire empire was in the grips of this terror. And they were starving. Nobody was getting enough. Nobody was producing enough. There wasn't even enough incentive to produce. Because everybody was losing money in the effort to produce anything. Boy, that's socialism for you. You know, they say if they instituted socialism in the Sahara Desert, they'd soon have a shortage of sand. And it's so true. That's the very nature of socialism. Because human nature says no to this. It's impossible. That's what price controls mean. You know how long it lasted? About two years. And after the end of two years, they just had to give it up. They realized that we're, we're killing the entire empire. <laughs> they were killing it by their inflation, but then they were, it was like in its death throes. And um, incessant wars and the, the, the money flowing out of the treasury and the efforts to, to replace it, all of that had caused inflation. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. And the governments, make, governments do that. They never learn. They never learn. Because... For people in government, it's all about power. And this is where socialists, I mean, you have these, these, these children in college who are learning from socialists. They're learning. Government is the answer. Government will save us. And they come out of the schools with socialist ideals, thinking we need, good we need big government. We need uh, all-powerful government to right our wrongs, to protect the weak, right? Government is the answer and the solution. No, it's often the perpetrator of those very evils. And uh, why? Because government is people. And you talk to somebody who's advocating socialism, you say, okay, you want the government to take care of this problem. That's right. And you say, well, who do you think is causing this problem? Well, I mean, the merchants are charging more for their food and people are going hungry. You say, well, why are they charging more? Well, the money is worthless. 
And how is the money worthless? Because of inflation. Well, what's causing inflation? Well, you know, the man in the moon or, you know, um, the, the, the tooth fairy or, or whatever. They, they can't, they don't know. They don't, can't tell you. It's, it's the government. It's the people in the government who are doing this. They're causing the inflation because of this, their political program. That's how they make political hay. And um, basically by reaching into the treasury and basically, you know, throwing money around other people's money, right? Um, but, you know, you, you ask these, these wide-eyed, doe-eyed socialists, you know, these 20-something socialists, well, you say the government is going to solve this problem. Well, okay, who is the government? Is the government made of people? Well, yeah, the government's made of people. It's not some kind of idol on the hill up there, right? It's not some kind of machine like a computer, a program, do what you want. It's people, okay? <clears throat> and who are these people? Well, they're the, you know, senators and congressmen and president and so on. So they're politicians. Would you say they're politicians? Well, yeah, they're politicians. Are they only politicians? Well, no. Government consists of other people they appoint to run offices and so on who are not elected, but they're chosen by those who are elected, right? So you say, okay, they're all people, and they're either politicians or bureaucrats. And what you're saying is the solution to all these problems is <clears throat> having the politicians have the control. Give the politicians the control over the food, the clothes, the energy, everything you need to live on. Give the politicians control over this, and that will make everything good and right, right? And at that point, you know, even the most the, what should I say the, the 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 dimmest bulb in the box, you know, will will begin to think, well, maybe that's not a formula for success. Maybe this is, could be part of the problem. Um, they may not admit it to you, but I think deep down they realize that gee, the, the bureaucrats. And the politicians, do we really want them to take control over the very things that we need to live? And do we need to want to look to them for what's right, prudent, intelligent, how to handle these things? Or is this actually a big mistake? Do I really want that? Do I really want socialism? Because you have to show them that that's what socialism means, you know? And let's face it, you know, when socialists come to power, they are not motivated to use their authority for the love of the people very often, are they? When they come to power as tyrants, they can turn the entire enterprise into a criminal enterprise. And when the criminals take control of the government by hook or by crook, or even by being elected, I mean, Hitler was legitimately placed in power by the... <coughs> By the emperor, right? You knew that, of course, right? So he came to power, you know, sad, is a criminal, certainly, but he was actually named to that position by the one who had the authority to put him there. So however a criminal gets into position, once he gets that power, he turns the entire government into one enormous criminal enterprise. And we might have seen that happen in history at times. Perhaps even in our own day, we see that happen in various places, right? So, but this is God allowing our sins to punish us. This is God allowing our sinfulness to serve as our own punishment, our own chastisement, right? The answer to him, stop sin offending God, stop sinning, follow the law of God, and pray, and do penance, right? Who said that? I know Tom Nagley has said that a number of times. <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> but I know you're citing the message from heaven here. So, yeah. so with that, I'll, I'll let you cite that message from heaven again. And, 
And, and finally, and I bring the bring the program to a close here. Okay. Well, Father, thank you. As you'd thank hoped you. it to do about <laughs> 30 minutes ago. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank you, Father. Appreciate it. Oh, God, sure. bless God bless you. God bless you. Thank you to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary to pray and do penance. Thank you. God bless you.